Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video because I kinda ended up getting sick after releasing the last Ancient DOS games video. So I started getting better around the middle of the week and I didn't really have enough time left to put together the proper episode, so I figured I'd throw together a quick filler and this is probably a pertinent one since this appeared in the last video and this is actually DOSBox's key mapper. Anytime I talk about the DOSBox key mapper, this is the thing I'm referring to. And I know it looks extremely intimidating because you've got all these different things here and it's like, what does everything do? But don't worry, I'm going to go over every aspect of this thing and tell you guys how to use it and how to make the most of it. And really, it's actually pretty simple when it comes down to it. So let's get into it. Firstly, one of the most important things to understanding what's going on here is that nothing on the screen right now has anything to do with your real devices. Like this does not represent your real keyboard. This does not represent real joystick controls. These are all the functions that DOSBox is emulating. So they're referred to as events. So if I click on one like the G key right here, this is referring to the event of key G, which is going through to DOSBox. And so this is like the G key on the emulated DOSBox keyboard. And it's bound to the real key G on your real keyboard. So it's basically the difference here. What you're looking at here are all the things that DOSBox emulates, and every one of them is bound to a real thing. So just for another example here, joystick access, axis one, or joystick axis Y minus on the first stick is currently mapped to axis one on the negative for my 360 controller. It's actually a DualShock 4 controller, but I haven't mapped through X input, so it thinks it's a 360 controller, but that's besides the point. The thing is, that's what's being mapped to this joystick function. And that's basically all there is to it. Like every single key on the keyboard is generally mapped to one of these DOSBox keys. And you can see me cycling through all of them right here. So the, up here you have the normal alphanumeric keys. Over here you've got the page control and cursor control keys. You've got the arrow keys and then the numeric keypad. And then over here are all the joystick functions. And this kind of changes depending on which joystick type you're emulating because DOSBox can emulate different kinds of joystick setups. So at most, you're gonna have four axes and six buttons with a CH emulation, but four buttons under normal emulation. And then your hat controls if you're emulating the Thrustmaster FCS or the CH flight stick. But then you have all of these functions right here. And this is actually all of the different things DOSBox itself is capable of doing. So for example, shutting down the DOSBox emulation itself is done with the F9 key. Except it's not. You see there's also a modifier set here. So that's what the modifier keys here are for. So modifier one, which as we saw, shutdown requires modifier one to be held down while pressing the real F9 key on your keyboard. And we see modifier one is either the left control key or it can also be the right control key. So you're seeing here, I can cycle through with the, uh, multiple binds using the next button here. So this shutdown key for F9 doesn't work unless modifier one is also held down. And this is pertinent because if you put, because like the modifiers here are the control keys, right? So if you tried to make it so that shutdown required key F9 and then you added a bind for like the control key, well, now what's gonna end up happening is that if you pressed F9 on its own or control on its own, you would shut down DOSBox. Needless to say, you don't wanna do that. And yeah, you just had hit the add button to add a key to bind or delete to delete that key. And before we move on to some practical examples, let's talk about saving here because you notice there's a save and an exit button here. They're two separate buttons. You can exit the DOSBox key mapper at any time and you'll be able to use your new mappings that you've defined, but they won't be saved. So if you want your mappings to permanently be saved so that they'll continue to function that way, you hit the save key. The only thing to keep in mind is that by default, DOSBox is going to use the exact same key mapper file for every game you run through it. Unless, of course, your games are all installed with different instances of DOSBox. For example, if you're downloading a bunch of games from the good old games website, GOG.com, every one of them is going to have its own instance of DOSBox, which means it's going to have its own instance of the mapper file. But if you're just using one 
copy of DOSBox to run multiple games, it's all going to be sharing the same mapper file by default. In which case, you're probably going to want to open your DOSBox configuration files for each of your different games, and then adjust the mapper file setting for it, so that you can actually just set up different mappers for every one of your games. And the mapper files themselves are just text files with all the binds listed in it, so you can even edit them by hand if you want to. And one final note about that is that if you do screw up a mapper file and you're not sure like how to fix it or anything because you've like totally derailed everything, just delete it. If the mapper file that you have configured for DOSBox isn't detected, it'll just use defaults. So you don't have to worry about that. So now let's get to some practical examples here. Let's say you're playing a particular DOS game that was made in the 80s and assumes that the function keys are on the side of the keyboard instead of the top of the keyboard and so is using them for like primary game functions. That's kind of awkward to do nowadays because nowadays our function keys are at the top of the keyboard, which kind of makes it hard to reach them. So for one example here, round 42 uses F1 as the fire button. Well, that's kind of inconvenient on a modern keyboard. Why don't we make it spacebar? So a common mistake is, oh, so spacebar, I want to make that F1. No, what you just did is you made it so that pressing F1 on your real keyboard generates a space key event in DOSBox. So this is the backwards way of doing it, which doesn't work. What you want to do is make it so that the F1 key emulated in DOSBox is bound to your spacebar. So we just ended up binding the real spacebar to the DOSBox event of the F1 key. And that's all you really need to do for round 42. Actually, round 42 also has um, the bomb feature on the F2 key. So you could always set that to something like the Z key on your keyboard. And there you go. Now pressing the Z key will cause the bombs to drop in round 42. Or wait a minute, what's... No, it's like a laser effect, not bombs. What am I thinking about? Another thing that's pertinent with DOSBox's key mapper here is in case you have a game that needs to use certain control and alt key combinations along with function keys to do certain game functions, or just certain program functions in general. Like, let's say you're running a game that needs you to press control F1 to do something. Well, if we go to the mapper here, you're going to see it's control F1 that actually brings up the DOSBox key mapper in the first place. So if that's a problem, we just get rid of it. So now there's no mapping for the key mapper here, which means we can't bring up the key mapper anymore with any key combinations, but we'll now be able to use control F1 in the game we're trying to play without this popping up every time we try it. So what you can do if there's more keys like that is just you know, go through and delete all of these. And that way nothing will affect DOSBox in any way. Though be a little careful with that just in case you get rid of something super critical. There have been a couple times in the past where I got rid of the video function, which is control alt F5, only to realize I needed to capture video of what I was doing. So I'd hit control F5, control alt F5, and I think I was recording, but I'm really not because I deleted the key binding for it. So be a little careful about stuff like that. One of the more common things to do with the key mapper though is to map keyboard keys to joystick functions or vice versa. So for example, if we're playing a game that prime works better with joystick support than with keyboard support, but we still want to use the keyboard, well, what we can do is we can assign real keyboard keys to the joystick axes. So for Y up, we could just say key up. For Y down, key down. For X to the left, key left. And for X to the right, key right. And so what we just did is we made it so that the arrow keys on our real keyboard are now affecting these directions on the joystick axis. So that's one of the more simple things that you would use to, the key mapper to do, but you might want to do it the other way. Let's say you have a game that doesn't have joystick support and you want to play it using a joystick or a gamepad or such. Well, in that case, what you would do is you it, probably the arrow keys, right? Or it could be the numeric keypad. So. It might be there, but it's probably the arrow keys. So what you could do here is just say add, and then I've got my gamepad in my hand right now. I can push up on the analog stick, and I just put it in here as axis one on the negative. And then we go here, add axis one on the positive. Go here, add axis zero on the negative, and then add axis zero on the positive. 
So I just mapped it so that the left analog stick on my controller here is now affecting all of these directions. And I can go one step further. I can say, add the hat up or add the hat down, add the hat left and add the hat right. And now I have all of these bound to the right keyboard key event in DOSBox. It might seem a little excessive, but remember that sometimes having multiple controls configured is a good thing because that way you're not trying to wrestle with your brain in terms of what exact keys you need to push to do something. Not to mention there might be considerations where sometimes you'd want to use the analog versus using the digital. Now one final thing to talk about here is kind of advanced and that's adding controls to games that don't already exist. This is not something you're going to run into often because most games are going to have like proper controls thought out and everything, but every so often you're going to run into a game which has a whole bunch of controls but it's missing sort of very specific things which might be more viable using a modern gamepad. So for example, let's just talk about Ken's Labyrinth for a moment. And that, that's a game I covered way back in the early days of Ancient DOS games. But what I did to make controlling that game better was I gave myself a pair of strafe left and strafe right buttons. But now here's the thing. Ken's Labyrinth doesn't have strafe left and strafe right buttons. It has the shift key here, which toggles a strafing mode. So when you're pressing left and right, normally you turn. But if you're holding shift as well, then it, they become strafing keys instead. But there's no actual strafing keys, like Doom uses comma and period by default for strafing left and right. But such controls don't exist in Ken's Labyrinth, so how do we make them? So I've got my DualShock 4 controller in my hands right now, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that the triggers are our strafing keys. And it's actually pretty similar to what I did before. So what we can do here is add the left trigger, which is detected as axis 2 on the positive, and then add the right trigger, which is detected as axis 2 on the negative, both to the shift key here. So now if I push either trigger, it's going to be detected as holding the shift key down. But we also want to make it so that using either of those triggers is going to also do left and right on the keyboard. So we can add the left trigger there and the right trigger there. And that's all we have to do for that. So now whenever we hold the left trigger down, it's going to trigger both the shift key over here and the left arrow key. So essentially we're giving ourselves a strafe left key. And then when we push the right trigger, it's gonna hold down the shift key as well, but also hold down the right key on the keyboard. Thus giving us strafe left and strafe right buttons. Now there is one downside to this. We won't, we can't turn at the same time as we're strafing. At least I don't think we can. I forget how Ken's Labyrinth handles that. I think it does, the shift key does interrupt the joystick controls as well and makes it so that joystick left and right also start strafing. But hey, we actually have strafe left and strafe right keys and proper turning controls. So even though we can't use them at the same time, we still can use them. And that makes the game surprisingly more playable than just with the default controls. And really, that's all there is to the DOSBox key mapper. It's just taking events that DOSBox is emulating and assigning real devices to them, either real keyboard keys or real gamepad or joystick functions. That's all it comes down to, and it's really simple when you get the hang of it. The only thing to keep in mind, specifically with a Windows 10 system, I don't know when this started happening, but if you try to open the DOSBox key mapper while the DOSBox is running full screen, it kind of crashes DOSBox. I've only seen this start happening recently on Windows 10, so I don't know if it's just my system or if it's some kind of thing that happened when Windows 10 made its last updates or something, but just something to keep in mind if you're on Windows 10, make sure you hit Alt-Enter to bring DOSBox into a window and then activate the key mapper. And then you should be good. I haven't had any problems opening the key mapper so long as it's running in a window. And that's it for this filler. Hopefully I've demystified the key mapper here for a bunch of you who might be having some issues with it. It's really not that big a deal once you get used to it, but it, as you can see, it is pretty intimidating with all the options available. But it's also really powerful once you take full advantage of it. Anywho, the next episode of Ancient DOS Games is going to be on Saturday, January 20th, 
and it's basically going to be the episode that was going to be supposed to be up this week if, until I got sick. And then just to make up for the fact that we've got a filler now, there's not going to be a filler on the third Saturday of February. That's just going to be a regular episode. So there's going to be a lot of regular episodes in a row. So hope you guys stay tuned for that and catch you guys on the next episode. Thanks for watching, everyone, and special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small sample of you guys.